As you know, we're journeying through a series entitled Unboxed. The concept behind the series is to unbox the reality of who Jesus Christ in the midst of the stories of Christmas. And the series began with the verse from Isaiah chapter 9, the classic Christmas verse, verse 6, where it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Last week, we talked at length about the reality of who Jesus is and that the reason why the government of Christ shall escalate and not diminish or should increase is largely in part of the reason that he is a wonderful counsel. You cannot govern properly. You cannot rule properly unless you have the wonderful or miraculous counsel of God, the miraculous wisdom of God. Today, we're looking at yet another facet of that. You may have the greatest of wonders of wisdom, of counsel, but without power, you are unable to affect that wisdom. In other words, if you were a smart, wise king, if you didn't have the matching power to affect that, your government will not have the power. You may be a very smart person. You may know the words of Scripture, but if you don't have the ability to implement that or live that out or have the power to live that out, then all that wisdom is in vain. And today we're going to look at a story, or two stories rather, in succession, Christmas stories that depict the power of God. Before I do that, I want to reference a little bit about the power of God. The power of God is not the typical thing that we see or we want when we look at human beings' powers. When we look at our power, it's not actually the kind of power that God manifests. Ours is a little noisy a bit of a showy kind of power. It's the kind that has laser. How many of you are waiting for Star Wars? It's the kind that has a zing, 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 all this noise. God's power is kind of like looking at the universe. It's quiet. It's still. Despite all of that, all of these gigantic, massive balls of fire are held at bay with no strings, no equipment. His power is different. It's a different kind of power that manifests, and we're going to see that in the story. I wanted to frame that. When you think about the sun, the sun quietly rises every day and is distant enough to make sure that that turbulence and that power does not disintegrate that because one second of that power traveling at great distance of millions of miles, that one second of that traveling power is equivalent to all of the power that mankind has ever produced from the beginning of history, scientists have estimated. That's how powerful God is. And yet it's so silent that that traveling burst of sun gives heat to your hands, your skin, warms and, and flourishes the, the, the greenery around us, if you may. The flora and the fauna is in, enhanced by this powerful sun. And I want to talk to you about that in light of understanding God's power in Christmas. Our text is found in Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Quick laying of the foundation of this story. This was in the days of Herod. The power, the king, gives us the history of the beginning of Christmas. Sometimes when you talk about Christmas, the common thread is the shepherds, the magi, the star, the angels. This is a little unique. And yet here we find resident the quiet power, the enormous power of God at work. There was a priest, and his name was Zechariah. And Zechariah was, a, uh, was an older man. He was a, a very well-experienced theologian and priest. And he had a wife who was really a a daughter of Aaron. In other words, she was from the line of priests. They were a very devout people. And Zechariah was from the group of the division of Abijah. I need you to understand this. There are about, at this point in history of Israel, there are about 20,000 so-called priests. And they were divided into divisions. And each division pretty much represented a, li a little over 1,000 men. And I want to make you understand that so you can see the context of what's about to happen here. Now, in the midst of that, there was a, Elizabeth, his wife, and this man were aging. 
and they were both righteous before God. They were both godly people. In other words, they were like you and me. They, we, they were living the right life. They were abiding in the law. They wanted to do what's right. And they were walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. In other words, they were good people. They were religious people. But here in this story, we're going to find that they, have, they, have, they had a situation. And the situation was they had no child. In which case, there was no future that they were looking forward to because Elizabeth was barren and both of them were advanced in years. In other words, they were aging. When you get to a certain age, you start counting that sooner or later, you're going to run out of time. And these guys don't have a child and they're aging and they're both aging. They're well advanced in years, the Bible says. So that's the frame of the situation here. Now, what happens next is interesting. Now, while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, now get this, 20,000 priests divided by 1,000, 20, in other words, in a given month, it's unlikely that your division would be chosen to serve that particular month, let alone out of the 1,000 people in your division, it's unlikely that you would be chosen to be the one to enter the Holy of Holies. Are you following in other words, it's, it's almost impossible for anyone to be the one who would be fulfilling this role. But for some reason, as we will find, God's way, God's power, allowed this man to be the man serving at that particular moment in history. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, and that's, there's a practice that these guys were doing. There's a custom, there's a way of reverencing God and praying to God and coming before him and that was his duty and he was chosen by lot in other words it wasn't by accident but in other words if you took 20,000 people and out of all those people you were the one who was chosen God had set it up that this guy or this priest would be the man who would be in this particular time in the temple now here's what happens next and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. He's doing, going about his regular duty. It would be like me doing my role as a minister, as a pastor. And all of a sudden, this angel shows up. None of you, that's, that's, can you imagine? Some, an angel just shows out of nowhere. Yeah, that's a frightful event. And there's a reason why the angel was there. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. And fear fell upon him. I'm jumping these verses because there's so many verses. I'm skipping and just focusing on the important parts here so you understand how the power of God works. Now, further, Zechariah was troubled. Naturally, if you were inside the Holy of Holies, you're doing what's customary, what's religious, what's righteous, what is something that is of a practice, a usual practice for hundreds of years. Naturally, when something like this shows up, you are in fear. You're, you're in trouble. Now, the fear of the Lord fell upon him. And Zechariah, the angel, said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Now, I believe, and as, we will, as the scripture will bear it out, Zechariah goes into the Holy of Holies mainly to pray for the coming of the Messiah. The Israelites to this day are still praying on a regular basis for the coming of their Messiah. And so even at this junction in history, the, this priest was praying for the coming of the Messiah. And on the side, I believe he was crying out to God and saying, Lord, give me a child. Right? And so here the, the angel comes and says, first of all, Zechariah, don't be afraid. There's no reason to be afraid. Your prayer has been heard and you are to you're going to have a son and you'll call this son john john by the way the the hebrew name john means the lord is gracious the grace of god is upon you you guys following the story so here's this man he's praying this prayer and then all of a sudden the angel comes and says god's heard your prayer and you're going to now have a son. Now we know from this, we can extract from this verse that he was praying for a son because the angel says, the Lord heard you. Now, and Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? Now, you're probably thinking, what does that statement mean? Here's what that statement really means. How do you expect me to believe this? That's what it means. How do you expect me to believe this now that I'm old 
My wife is barren. I'm old. How do you expect me to believe this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And basically what he's saying is, how can you expect me? It's too late. Are you here? How many of you have ever prayed a prayer and then God answered it and then when he answered you don't want to accept the prayer? <laughs> and that's how ridiculous we are. I mean, this guy was praying to God and saying, God, give me a child. God answers the prayer and now the prayer is there and he's saying, no, I don't want the answer because it's impossible that you're doing this because he doesn't understand the power of God. That God's power is not the kind of power that you and I think of it to be. The power of God is actually rather a silent kind of power that demands faith from us, that demands that we believe and agree with him. This guy has been praying for years for a child, God answers, and all of a sudden he says, I'm not sure I want this thing. I actually think this answer is too late. Now the angel, I think, gets ticked off a little bit. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. By the way, if you read your Bible, there are two angels that are mentioned in Scripture. There's millions of angels, gazillions of them, the Bible says. However, there are two that are named. One of them is Michael, who is the archangel. He's the angel of war. And there's a guy named Gabriel. This is Gabriel. And Gabriel is a messenger. He says, I stand on the presence of God, in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Gabriel is basically a messenger angel. I'm here to bring you this good news. I'm here to tell you that you're about to have a child. And instead of receiving the news, and behold, you will be silent and you will be unable to speak because you decided not to believe this. This thing will take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in the proper time. In other words, the reason why you, your words do not have authority and power, the reason why you don't have the kind of influence that you should have is because you are not in agreement. You don't believe my words. Rather, these things are actually going to be fulfilled in the fullness of time. Now, verse 21 says, and the people were waiting for Zechariah and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. They were saying, what, what's going on with him? What, wh why is he not out here? He's supposed to pray Come out and then bless the people. That's the job of the priest. These days, that's not my job. We're all priests in Christ. In other words, I don't have to access God, get the blessing from God and give it to you. We are in Christ priests unto him. We can all go to him and access him. My job is to keep teaching you that word so that you can keep trusting in the power of God and going about your business as a believer. Now, the people were waiting for Zechariah and they were wondering What's going on with him? What's taking, taking so long? And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. There's something happened to him. And they kept making signs with him. And they remain, he remained mute. In other words, he couldn't say anything. There was no power in his words. There's no power. I was in a, uh, I was in a funeral last night, as I've said. And you could feel that obviously when a man dies and he dies at a young age, it's not a very pleasant thing, especially in the season of the year. And when I was preaching, my message was about the resurrection from the dead. And I proclaimed the reality of Christ's power to resurrect people from the dead. My job as a minister, your job as a believer is to proclaim that and declare that regardless of what the situation may be regardless of how depressed the moment was. And in fact, at the end of the service, the wife and the children all came and said, you know, there was something very powerful about the service. Because that's what we do. We declare the power of God. And there's nothing more evident in the power of God than resurrecting a dead man's body. That God can actually transform that. Now further it says, when his time of service was ended, he went home to his home, and after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. Now, for five months, she kept herself hidden. Interestingly, when you look at God's power, it's not necessarily displayed or demonstrated in public. It is actually hidden. 
God's about to do something miraculous here. A barren woman who was barren for many, many years, someone of old age. He was not necessarily promoting this. He was actually hiding this thing. Elizabeth was hidden in the midst of this miracle. There's something about God's power. I think God's power, the reason why God keeps that is because he's trying to demonstrate something more, more important to us than just his power. I believe that the reason why God gave us a baby it's really more than to demonstrate his power was to demonstrate his love so that we can enjoy his power. The reason why God is, does these things is sometimes we're looking for an evidence of God's power when the reality is God's power is moving inside of us as we will see through the Holy Spirit. In summary of that story, God delivers us from curses and barrenness. His power does. God makes a way where there is no way. It is seemingly crossroad this seemingly situation that has no way out and God still makes a way through his power and finally God demands our agreement with his power now the story doesn't end there what happens next is Gabriel is sent on another mission in the sixth month six months after this thing event this event the angel Gabriel does this time sent by God to a city of Galilee the city in Galilee of Galilee named Nazareth he sends this time, at one point, he sends him to a priest, a guy who's institutional, a guy who's theologically versed, a guy who's very knowledgeable, a guy who's an important man. He's sensitive to the very uh, temple where God resides. And all of a sudden, this angel is now sent to a provincial town. And instead of meeting an older man who was well-versed and very experienced, he sends him to a young teenager who are very humble beginnings, actually a very poor virgin. And he sends him, or he sends, God sends him to Mary, and he encounters her, the virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. This is what happened. Six months after the first story, the second story happened, happens, and this angel shows up in the house of Mary, and he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. If you've ever played, how many of you are, were formerly Catholics or some of you are still Catholics? That's not a bad thing, amen? But if you've ever played the Hail Mary, this is where they got that. Hail Mary, greetings. Hail Mary. Are you here? Some of you are not sure. Some, some of you, you never prayed that prayer before? Hail Mary. Full of grace. Hail Mary, O favored one. That's what grace is. You're full of grace. The Lord is with you. How many of you prayed this prayer before? Some of you just look like you, did, you just came from outer space. Okay. Okay. The Lord is with you. That is an actual prayer. That's a biblical prayer. Okay? Are you following? So that's where they got that. Prayers that you pray should be biblical. If you, uh, bi 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 biblical. <laughs> it's jet lag. Okay, if you follow me on Facebook, four times a week I post a prayer based on the Bible. It's what I read and I craft it into a prayer because the best prayers are Bible prayers. They're powerful. You don't have to make, make them up. You just read the Bible and craft them into a prayer and pray that prayer and you know that prayer is God's will for you because it's from Scripture. Now, he says, the, the angel goes to bear and says, greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Okay. You're full of grace. But she was greatly troubled. In other words, Mary knew who she was. She wasn't anybody. She was just a maiden. She was a poor virgin. She was a teenager. And she was greatly troubled at the saying. And she tried to discern what sort of greeting might this be? What, 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 why are you calling me this? Is everybody following the story? And all this is the power of God. These are about angels. There's nothing more powerful than angels. And yet this is happening in a very quiet moment. One happened in a very isolated moment inside the temple that nobody saw except Zechariah. And now this is happening between a maiden and an angel. Now, here's what happens next. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call him Jesus. I'm, I'm skipping some verses just to make you get, get, get the story through you. Basically, the angel says, you will have a baby and you will bear a son 
and you will call his name Jesus. The word Jesus means the Lord saves. God's about to ramp on the Christmas story. The Lord is gracious and the Lord saves. Now, if you were Mary and you heard this, that's weird. I'm going to have a baby, okay? How am I going to have a baby? Where is this baby going to come from? I've got a boyfriend. I've got a fiancé. But is that going to come from him? Now, here's what happens next. He will be great. And he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him, give to him the throne of his father, David. She's basically, the angel is basically declaring, Mary, it's not you who's going to be great. It's your son who's going to be great. Are you here? Some of you are not sure. Now, he will be great. He is the one who is going to be the called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. He is the one. He is the savior. He is the source of the grace. Now, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. He will reign. Mary, not you. He. And he will reign forever. And his kingdom, there will be no end. Mary, you're full of grace. The Lord is with you. But he. Everybody say he. All right? I mean, he's clarifying this thing. Making sure that you understand that it's Jesus who saves and the grace of God flows through him. Mary said to the angel, how will this be? Interesting, isn't it? Same response that Zechariah had. Zechariah said, I can't believe that you're telling me this. Mary, it's not quite the same statement. Mary's statement is, how will this be? Basically, what she's saying is, artificial insemination has not been invented yet. Okay? That's what she's saying. What she's saying is, this has not happened. The story of Zechariah happened to Abraham, happened to Samuel's parents. But this thing where a baby comes out without a father, it hasn't been done yet. So how can this be, she's saying. How can this actually be possible? I am a virgin. In other words, Zechariah's declaration is, it's too late. Mary's declaration is, it's a little too early. This is weird, okay? I don't get it. I'm puzzled. She's having a conversation with an angel here. And God's about to manifest his power. It's amazing how God's power works. Sometimes we're, we're so inundated with, and I, and I get that. I know that God heals the blind and makes the lame walk and all of that. I believe in all of that. Sometimes we're just into the display thing. We just like to display. God's power, as you will find out here, is, doesn't work that way. It's actually very quiet. My, uh, the funeral yesterday was a little interesting because the man who passed away was one of my best friends in high school. And he and I parted ways when I became a Christian and he went on his merry way with his life. And his wife is actually my wife's best friend in high school or classmate in high school, close friend high school, in high school, and, and they got together and they separated. And he got saved at our church in Pioneer, and his children got saved at our church here. Actually, they're probably here. And so there's an estranged thing in their family. In other words, boys are a little bitter with dad, and it's, just, it's not a good situation. And so during the funeral, as I was speaking, I said, does anybody want to say anything about this man, I mean, who's passed away. And the, the, one of the nieces came up and read a poem, wrote a poem, a very nice poem about him. And the grace of God and the power of God started to flow in the room. And then the youngest son came up without notes and began to honor his father. And after that, the middle child gets up and does the same thing. And finally, the oldest son, who's, who, who's a member of our church here, started to honor his father. And people stream. In fact, I was supposed to do that because uh, the, half of the family was Catholic and half the family were from our church. So I was supposed to do that at the beginning and at the end of that, there was supposed to be a mass. 
And because of the number of people that started to, the brothers of the deceased came, who were also estranged from him, came up and they started to all honor him. There was a change in the atmosphere of the room. In fact, it got a little long that the, the, the Jesuit priest who was supposed to do the mass tried, called me and said, hurry it up a little bit because I have to go somewhere else. And it was interesting how God moved the power of God. In fact, at the end of it all, the wife was telling us, this is amazing. The oldest son said, I never expected for this thing to turn out like this. I never expected that this is how we're going to be reconciled. I couldn't believe that my mother would forgive my father and spend literally the last few months of his life every day taking care of him. I couldn't believe that that was possible because I was a child. That's all I wanted to see. That's the power of God. Sometimes the power of God is something we're all trying to do. God's power is moving right now. We're oblivious. We're kind of like Zechariah. We're praying for things. We're believing for things from God. And then when he answers us and I don't, know, I don't know if I even want this. I can't even believe that you're doing this. How will this be? Sometimes we do that, don't we? How will this be? How can this be? It's too late or it's too early. And, and the fact of the matter is we all have these questions. But the power of God works inside of us through the Holy Spirit. Now the angels answer, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. This quiet Spirit of God will be inside of you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. This power will be upon you. And when I was in San Diego, I, I was having coffee in this coffee shop. And I would walk there and I would speak to this girl and this lady rather, and I'd say, I'd like to order this coffee and all these things. And, and she would always had a smile that was from corner to corner, ear to ear, just a brilliant smile. She was a Latina. And I was say, she said, good morning, sir. And I would, and she, oh, so finally, the last day, I just looked at her and said, why are you always smiling? And then she said, do you really want to know? I mean, this is, I can't copy her, but she, she was, she, and I said, yes, I want to know. And out it came and said, because of Jesus Christ. And then she began to preach to me. She said, you know, before, I didn't believe in Jesus Christ. I only was religious. I only just go to Catholic church. And, I'm, and she started saying all these things. And said, no, 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 just take it easy. And then she started preaching to me. But Jesus is real. And the power of the Holy Spirit was just coming out of her. And I stand, stood there for about five minutes just to listen to her. I was actually getting entertained. I finally just had to stop her and say, listen, I'm a pastor. I'm one of you. But thank God the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you. The power of the Holy Spirit is working. And here we are looking for things. Zechariah. God's already answering the, the prayers. And we're busy looking for oh, the manifestation. I want it to look like a, a, a laser sword. We're inundated with that and God's power is already resident in us. The Holy Spirit's inside of you and His power, this mighty God, His power will overshadow your affairs. Can you trust that, Mary? Can you trust that, Zechariah? Can you trust that, Joey? That His power is in you, will overshadow your affairs. Now, therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. Mary, this is so powerful. This is what's going to set people free. This is going to be the basis of God's empowering the entire world for those of them who choose to believe that he sent us his son. It's an amazing moment when you think about Christmas. Behold, your relative Elizabeth who's from the other town, who's old age, who's already old in, in, old in age, has also conceived the son. The angel's briefing Mary. Mary, once you get pregnant, it's going to get weird. In other words, if you think that there's no one else who knows about this, God has already set it up where you've got this cousin of yours is already pregnant and she's going to be your small group for the time being. Amen? 
Some of you need a small group. Some of you, after all these years of telling you you need a small group, you need a small group. When you get pregnant in a weird way, you're going to need someone who's as weird as you. Amen? And she said, you know, your, your relative Elizabeth in her old age is also going to see the son. And the sixth month with her who was called barren. In other words, the same miracle that you're going to experience, she's experiencing it right now. It's been going on for six months, Mary. Go to the small group so you can hear her story. Go listen to someone else who's empowered by the Holy Spirit. For nothing, nothing, everybody say nothing, will be impossible with God. He's so powerful. You're just looking at the wrong places and you're looking at the wrong way. The fact is nothing is impossible. He can make a way where there's no way. He can make a way with the barrenness, in the cursed situation, in the family that's broken apart, a miracle can happen. It wasn't exactly my greatest moment being jet lagged yesterday of preaching, but it wasn't about my preaching. It was about the power of the Holy Spirit moving in the lives of people and the testimony of, a so, of sons that have forgiven their father. Now, Mary said, Behold, this is an amazing response. The difference between Zechariah and her was, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. God, I'm just your servant. So we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Don't add the Holy Mother of God, okay? Are you here? And pray for us sinners because that's not in the Bible. Her response was, I am a servant of the Lord. I need God. In fact, more than just a servant of the Lord, let me be done to me according to your word. Let, let, whatever it is you've said, do it. Do it to me. That's why we revere her and we honor the story is because she just basically said, listen, what you said yeah, better than the priest over there who knows the story of Abraham, who knows the story of Samuel, who knows what needs to respond, how to respond properly and refuses to respond the way she did. And she said, no, I'm a servant of the Lord. Be it done to me according to your word. And the angel departed her. God's power can change our situation overnight. God's power means nothing is impossible and God's power demands our agreement. If we're, if we're going to see God's power fulfilled in our life, we're going to have to agree with it. We're going to have to say, God, I agree that you can do it. I look at the, our building is a little surreal. I think we're almost there. I mean, every time I look at the garden and the way it's coming up, it keeps reminding me about God's power. Nothing big, nothing brilliant, no schemes, just the power of God. And the more we believe that, uh, when you say, how can this be? And I remember that, that would be the kind of question I would have had years ago when we were building the building. How can this be? God, how are you going to do this? Well, he can. His power can. Now, let me close this story. Finally, in chapter 1, verse 39, in those days, Mary arose and went with, with haste into the hill country to the town of Judah. Basically, she realizes I got to get encouraged. I'm going to get pregnant. I am pregnant. And I've got to go to somebody because if she's caught pregnant, she's going to be stoned to death. Okay? She goes and enters the house of Zechariah and greets Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. That, that's powerful, isn't it? Your, 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 your simple greeting somebody. Can you imagine that? That's who you are. That's who we are, filled with the Holy Spirit. When you greet somebody, the power of the Holy Spirit touches them. That's why when you get out of this place, don't frown. Don't, put a smile on your face. Because sometimes the Holy Spirit is already moving, but they're looking at your face and it's, it's, it's quenching the Holy Spirit in them. <laughs> are, are you following? But just the mere greeting of this woman and the baby jumps. Because the Holy Spirit in Elizabeth is being ministered to. It's powerful, isn't it? That you can actually change and transform lives and change the course of whatever is going on in an atmosphere by the power of God. That's why he says, not just a wonderful counselor, he is a mighty God. 
And not just a mighty God, a mighty God who lives inside of you. That is powerful. Now, she's filled with the Holy Spirit and, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women. That's the Hail Mary right there. Hail Mary full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that. That's biblical. It's when you go to the Holy Mary, Mother of God. Pray for us sinners. Think about that again before I'm not trying to fight religion here. I'm just trying to teach you the Bible. Okay? Be careful about how you pray. You don't pray to Mary. You revere Mary because of what she's done, her faith. You, you, you copy that. You live for that. You don't pray to her. You pray to Jesus. Can somebody say amen? Some of you, you've got not just Mary, you've got Buddha. You've got other stuff. Okay? You've got all kinds of stuff. You already have the real thing. Amen? Merry Christmas. I love you, okay? Just need you to understand that. Get your theology right. Okay? And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now, sometimes they make a mistake. But they said the mother of the Lord. No, this is a question from Elizabeth. She doesn't even know what she's saying. She's asking a question. Why is, the, why is this granted to me that the mother of the Lord should come to me? She's asking. And Mary straightens her out. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb bleed for joy. And blessed is she who believed that she would. Basically, we say, I, I, you're blessed because you believed that there should be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Amazing, isn't it? And she's asking her this question. Mary responds with this very familiar, very popular prayer, declaration of the power of God. My soul magnifies the Lord. It's not me. I'm magnifying him. I'm nobody. I'm a peasant girl, a virgin from a provincial town. I'm worthy of nothing. I'm magnifying the Lord. Not only am I magnifying the Lord, my spirit rejoices because I need a savior like everybody else. I can't save you. I'm not the savior. Jesus is the savior. He has looked on me in our humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. That's a powerful thought. He's looked at my humble state and saved me. And behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. You know what that means? What that means is from this day forward, what has done, God has done for me will never be forgotten. This miraculous, powerful event in history will be talked about. And that's why after 2,000 years... We're still talking about it. Because this powerful event in history where God comes to this humble woman in her state, saves her, and says, I'm going to work through you. For he who is mighty has God done great. There's that idea of mighty power, the mighty God. He's saying, this is only possible because my God is not just a wise God. He's not just a loving God. He's a mighty God. He's my Savior. And his holy is his name. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. She knew where to park. She knew, I can't go home just yet. I've got to stay in my small group a little while longer. You understand why, right? If she goes home, the options are limited to three. Number one, Joseph decides to marry her, which he won't because... He's wondering why she's pregnant. Got it? Number two, I'm going to divorce her. The third option is stone her to death. And here's the big idea about God's power. Where you have limited options, God has extra options. What you thought when you sit down and calculate this, these are the only options left. Either you get married and do an unrighteous wedding or get divorced or get stoned to death. If you thought that were your only options, God is more powerful than your options. He has other options that you didn't know exist. That's the story here. 
Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. So finally Elizabeth gives birth, Mary's home. And you know the story, just before Mary goes home, God sends another angel. Joseph has a dream and tells him, you got to marry this girl. God has options. He's powerful. Amen? Now, the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. And the neighbors and the relatives heard the Lord. The Lord had shown great mercy to her and they rejoiced with her. So the neighbors are, wow, well, can you imagine this woman who, who was barren, this woman who's old, gave birth. Let's celebrate with her. So they throw a party. And after the, eight, after the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. In other words, the name of this guy is Zechariah Jr. He's going to be a priest just like his father. He's going to be a doctor like his father. He's going to be a lawyer. They, they were setting them up. But his mother answered, no. He shall be called John. But none of your relatives are named like that. How can you do that? I mean, you, this is against tradition. This is against custom. What room do you got to do this? It's like an Italian dis discussion here. None of your relatives are called by this name. He should be Zechariah Jr. <laughs> said, no, you can't do that. This is not defined by tradition, by customs, by laws, by your practices, by your desires. By your innuendos, by your thoughts, by your whatevers. This is decided by the power of God. This child is named John because God is gracious. Now, they went to his father and they made sign languages to him. Signs to his father says, inquire, what, what do you want to call him? He should be Zechariah Jr. He should be named after you. And because he couldn't talk, he's lost his influence. When you lose the influence of the power of God inside of you and refuse to speak it the way you should, there's no power. In the closing moments of my message yesterday at the funeral, I spoke about the power of God. I told everybody in that room that the power of God is able to resurrect this dead body back to life. There's something powerful when we declare that on the inside of us. And John, rather Zechariah, was asked to get a writing tablet. And he wrote his name is John. And all the religious friends and co-priests and wives and relatives and friends were, what in the, what are you talking about? Hmm, what is Zechariah Jr.? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, his mouth spoke. You know, Darth Vader can do this and you can't talk. <laughs> God can do that to you, amen? <laughs> if you think God doesn't have the power, it's actually worse because words are coming out of your mouth and they're useless, if not senseless. But with the power of God, the mighty God inside of you, you speak life. His mouth was loosened and opened and his tongue was loosed and he spoke the blessing of God, the power of God and fear. Why do people fear? They sense power. Came on all their neighbors and all these things were talked about through the hill country of Judea. That's the power of God. God gave us a baby, not just to demonstrate his power, really, but to demonstrate his love. So that you and I can experience His power. The Holy Spirit moving inside of us to believe what seemingly is a cursed, barren situation that can no longer happen, He can. Where there are no longer options, He has. Where doors are closed and are silenced, He can lose in your tongue. If you will but agree with Him. You have the power, not just the wonderful counsel, you have the mighty power. Amen? Would you stand on your feet as we close in a word of prayer? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just bow your heads, close your eyes, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Thank you, God. Can you look up here for a minute? It just hit me now. 
What God did for Elizabeth, what God did for Mary, what God does for each one of us is not always the same. That's how powerful He is. If you're going on a vacation, He'll meet you there. If you need forgiveness and reconciliation, He has the power. If He wants to heal you, He's got the power. The point is, will you choose to believe and will you choose to agree and will you choose to declare? Amen? Don't ever look at somebody and say, hey, why, why does he have that? No, no, no. That's different. Elizabeth's situation, time, is different from Mary's situation. The point is God has the power. Amen? Close your eyes. Lift up your hands towards heaven. God, thank you that you're not just a wonderful counselor. You hold the heavens afloat. You have the power. The silent the magnificent, the gracious, saving power of our God. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Holy Spirit of God, seal this truth in our hearts. As we walk out of here, may we know that power is resident inside of us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen.